Welcome back to the Endocrine System on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we did a pretty extensive study of how the interplay between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland works. And what we saw is that the hypothalamus is going to make these hormones that are called releasing hormones. They all end in RH. And so, for example, going up here, we have thyrotropin releasing hormone, corticotropin releasing hormone, prolactin releasing hormone, and so on and so forth. And what the hypothalamus does after making these is it sends them through this blood vessel network, which you really can't see here, but this network of blood vessels is called the hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system. And it carries these releasing hormones into the anterior pituitary gland. Now this whole thing down here is the pituitary gland, but it has a posterior part over here, which is what we're gonna talk about, and then the anterior part, which we previously talked about. And once these releasing hormones end up in the anterior pituitary gland, they trigger the release of other hormones, which we term tropic hormones. And so, for example, if we're looking at TRH, thyrotropin-releasing hormone, that's made in the hypothalamus. It's sent through this blood vessel network into the anterior pituitary, where it triggers the release of thyroid-stimulating hormone, or TSH, from the anterior pituitary, and then that's released into the blood where it goes to a particular tissue and has some target effect, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. But what I want you to understand about that is the strategy that the anterior pituitary uses, okay? It requires a releasing hormone made by the hypothalamus, and that releasing hormone has to travel to the anterior pituitary where it stimulates it to make something else. Okay, and we summarized this in uh, the previous video. Now we're going to look at the posterior pituitary gland, and we're going to see that the strategy is very different. Now, before we get into that strategy, I want to clear up some things that are misconceptions about the posterior pituitary gland. First of all is that it's not a gland. In fact, the name posterior pituitary gland is a misnomer. So here's the thing about the pituitary. Okay, This whole thing is the pituitary. Okay? And even to call it a pituitary gland is a misnomer. The way the pituitary is structured is the anterior part of it, which we talked about in the previous video, that is a true gland. We know it's a gland because it releases hormones, right? So it's the anterior pituitary gland. The back part of it, which is the posterior pituitary, is not glandular tissue. In fact, it's neural tissue. In fact, the posterior pituitary is really just a downgrowth of the hypothalamus. So in the front you have glandular tissue, in the back you have neural tissue. So it's incorrect to call this a gland. So what they've actually done is they've, they use a different naming system, which I'm going to always forget to use. Uh, but basically, the, the pituitary as a whole is what's called the hypothesis. Not the hypothesis, like in a, in a scientific question, hypothesis, which is actually where this portal system gets its name. Hypothalamic for hypothalamus, hypophyseal for hypothesis. And so that's the whole thing. So if you want to talk about the anterior pituitary, it is the adenohypothesis. Adeno or adeno refers to glandular tissue, like an adenoma is a cancer of glandular tissue. The back part is neural tissue, so it's the neurohypothesis. Although I'm probably going to mess up and I'm going to refer to it as the posterior pituitary gland, but I'm going to try to use the term neurohypothesis. And the fact that this is neural tissue and simply a downgrowth of the hypothalamus is going to play a role in its strategy and how it's different from the adenohypothesis in the front. Okay, so look here in the hypothalamus. We got a couple neurons here. Now, of course, there's not just one of each. There's thousands of each, okay, probably more than that. But these neurons have their cell bodies in the hypothalamus. Notice their axons extend downward through this stalk, which we term the infundibulum, and they extend downward, and their terminal end bulbs are actually in the posterior pituitary, or the neurohypothesis, okay? These neurons are specific for manufacturing a particular type of hormone, but they're not releasing hormones, okay? The strategy of the hypothalamus is to make these two hormones and just simply move them down the axon 
to the end bulb, and the mechanism of their release is an action potential, not a releasing hormone. So let's actually look at one of these as an example to hopefully understand it. So this type of neuron right here, this is a neuron that manufactures oxytocin. And neurons that make oxytocin are termed paraventricular nuclei. Okay, So these neurons make oxytocin. Now, the synthesis of the hormones occurs in the cell body. It doesn't really occur anywhere else in the neurons, so it's in the cell body. So right here at the top, this is where the oxytocin is made, and it's packaged into vesicles. Well, those vesicles containing this oxytocin are moved down the axon. Okay, They're moved down the axon, and then they reach this terminal end bulb, and they just store them there. Okay. So first of all, did we have a releasing hormone that triggers the synthesis and release of another hormone down here? No. The same hormone that we're going to release from the posterior pituitary is the same hormone that we make up in the hypothalamus. So all we do is we package it and then just simply move it down. So there are no releasing hormones on this side of the pituitary. So oxytocin is made up here, packaged in a vesicle, moved down here and stored. And since this is a neuron, whenever there's a stimulus for oxytocin release, it's an action potential that leads to its release. So those vesicles exocytose and dump that oxytocin into the blood, where they end up in the general circulation and perform some functions, which we're going to briefly talk about in a minute. Okay? And so this is not exactly relevant at this point in the topic, but again, the neurons that make oxytocin are collectively termed paraventricular nuclei. We also have another hormone that is released from the posterior pituitary. Uh, and again, it's made in the hypothalamus and it works by the same mechanism. And this hormone is called ADH or antidiuretic hormone. Okay? The neurons that make this hormone are collectively called the supraoptic nuclei. But again, I digress. So again, these hormones, ADH, are made in the cell bodies of this neuron, which are going to be in the hypothalamus. They're packaged into vesicles, and then they're simply moved down this axon through the infundibulum and into the terminal end bulbs here where they are stored in the event that you're going to need them. Then when there's a stimulus for ADH requirement, these neurons fire action potentials and exocytose their vesicles, and that dumps the ADH into the blood, where it goes through the general circulation to do whatever it is that it does. So the key here that I want to make absolutely clear is the strategy that the posterior pituitary or neurohypothesis uses is different than the anterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary is going to require a releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, which travels through a network of blood vessels called the hypothalamic hypothesial portal system, where it ends up in the adenohypophysis, or anterior pituitary, and then triggers the synthesis and release of a specific hormone that we see right here. And then those go into the blood. The neurohypophysis has a different strategy. It uses neurons. It makes those hormones in the hypothalamus, packages them into vesicles, and then just moves them along the axon into the posterior pituitary where they await an action potential, in which case they're exocytosed and released into the blood, and they go do their respective functions. Now, the nice thing about the, the posterior pituitary is that's a pretty simple mechanism. There's also only two of these, okay? And so now, very briefly, we're going to go over their functions. We're going to have separate videos where we look at their functions in a little more detail, but I'm just going to mention what they do. Okay? Let's talk about oxytocin first. Oxytocin, one of its main functions is being permissive with prolactin in terms of milk ejection. We're going to have a later video in this playlist where we discuss prolactin's function. Prolactin is going to act on the mammary glands and cause the production of milk for breastfeeding, right, infants. Well, it turns out that prolactin only allows the synthesis of that milk. So if you have no way to get that milk out of the breast, it doesn't do the infant any good. So prolactin causes the synthesis of the milk. Oxytocin causes the ejection of the milk. And we're going to talk about that in more detail later. And so we say they're permissive because one cannot function without the other. It doesn't do you any good to make the milk if you can't eject it. An analogy for this would be like if you're trying to make a homemade bow and arrow system. Okay? You can make all the arrows you want in the world, but if you don't make a bow to fire those arrows, it doesn't do you any good. You have to have both of them, and you can't have one without the other. So you could say, in some respects, the bow is permissive with the arrows. 
Okay. The second function of oxytocin is uterine contractions during labor. So it turns out that oxytocin in the uterus will trigger smooth muscle contractions that kind of force the infant out uh, during labor. So what happens during labor is when the infant's head pushes on the cervix, which is basically where the interface between the uterus and the vaginal canal is, you get more and more oxytocin release. And the harder the head pushes against the cervix, the more oxytocin gets released. And then oxytocin will help to stimulate those uh, smooth muscle contractions or uterine contractions to help induce labor and push the infant out. Another interesting fact about oxytocin is its role in pair bonding in women. Okay? It's not that men can't pair bond, although that operates by a different hormone that we'll see in a minute. But particularly in women, it's known that it has a psychological effect on helping women bond with both their partner, their spouse, but also their infant. So whenever a mother is holding her child, assuming she's in the right frame of mind, she'll get oxytocin release, which will help promote a bond between her and her child. So that's what oxytocin does in a nutshell. ADH, let's look at that now, antidiuretic hormone. Now, one thing about antidiuretic hormone is it has another name which is also important. It's called vasopressin. In fact, let me actually type that out so you can see it. It is called vasopressin. Okay? Now, if we think about what the term vasopressin might mean, vaso refers to blood vessels. Pressin means to press together or to constrict. So one function of this ADH or vasopressin, however you want to term it, is vasoconstriction. And I think I actually wrote vasopressin there. I didn't realize that. But vasopressin or ADH can promote vasoconstriction in some, uh, in some blood vessels. Also, it will cause the kidneys to retain water. So think about the name antidiuretic hormone. Diuretic or diuresis means to urinate. So if you are anti-diuretic, you're preventing urination. And you might want to do that if you're low on water, if you're dehydrated. So if you're dehydrated, that would actually be a stimulus for ADH release. So dehydration will cause action potentials that release ADH into the blood, and that will trigger the kidneys to retain water in a negative feedback mechanism. We'll talk about that much later in the playlist on the urinary system. The third thing interesting about ADH or vasopressin is that it promotes pair bonding in men. Now, it's not to say that oxytocin doesn't do it in men, and it's also not to say that ADH doesn't do it in women. It just has been shown scientifically that oxytocin has a much bigger role in women, ADH has a much bigger role in men. And so pair bonding in men is promoted mostly by ADH, believe it or not. Um, and so that would be a man bonding with his partner or spouse or bonding with the child. Now, what's interesting about these two hormones, and actually might play a role in why this third fact is true for each of them, is these two hormones are very similar in structure. Um, they are peptide hormones, and it turns out that they only differ by two amino acids. Their sequences only differ by two amino acids, so structurally they are very similar to one another. And so that structural similarity may play a role in this part of their functional similarity. Okay? So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the posterior pituitary or the neural hypothesis and how that strategy differs from that of the adenohypothesis or anterior pituitary. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.